Independent Project and is not endorsed by the Department of Defense or any military component. The views expressed are those of the host. The content of this podcast is not meant to be legal or medical advice. Warning, this episode contains graphic details of murder and is not suitable for young listeners. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome back, True Crime Army. I am your host, Margo, and this is a true crime podcast where I focus on crimes committed by military members and veterans. But don't worry, you don't have to know anything about the military to listen, I promise. You just have to be a true crime enthusiast. And if that's you, welcome home. Many of you wonder how I pick the weekly episodes. And to be honest, there is no real rhyme or reason to my case selection. Sometimes it's to honor a particular month, for example, Women's History Month, Hispanic Heritage Month, or the month of the military child. Sometimes it's a listener recommended case that had me going down a rabbit hole. Sometimes I have a case picked out and when I sit down to really dig in, research and write, there are just too many holes for me to properly cover the case without further reach back to people involved in a case. And sometimes, as in this week, the listener requests for one particular case are overwhelming. In just the last few weeks, I have had close to a dozen requests for this particular case. And when I started digging, my jaw was on the floor. Many of you believe that episode one of Military Murder, the story of Stephen Schapp, is the craziest case I have covered to date. But by the end of this episode, I bet you will think today's perpetrator gives Stephen Schapp a run for his money. Join me today as I discuss the disappearance of Air Force veteran Trisha Todd. Now, let's dig in. My sources for this episode include various documentaries on this case, including Investigation Discoveries, The Object of Murder, Oxygen Network's Criminal Confessions, and a Crime Watch Daily episode. Additional resources include articles in the Palm Beach Post, Chilling Crimes blog, and my all-time favorite web source is Military Justice for All. If you are a military true crime fan, you really need to keep up with Military Justice for All. Jen Norris, the creator of that website, she keeps up to date with all military true crime stories. Trisha Gale Todd was born on February 19th, 1986. She came from a big family. And when I say big family, I mean her immediate family was huge. She was the only girl and she had seven brothers. Trisha was from Hope Sounds, Florida, and she enjoyed a pretty low key life. Her and her future husband, Stephen Williams, met in elementary school and they began dating in high school. They joined the Air Force and got married there while on active duty. Eventually, though, at some point, Trisha left active duty and pursued a nursing degree using her GI Bill. Trisha was very religious and she was very much a philanthropist, going on mission trips to foreign countries all the time. Trisha and Stephen had been married for nine years before they welcomed a beautiful baby girl. Her name was Faith. They were a picture of beauty. They just looked like a really happy couple. But After 11 years of marriage, they decided to part ways and they divorced. It was a friendly divorce, though. No fighting about child custody. It was just very peaceful. Her father, David, told Crime Watch Daily that it was such an amicable divorce that he was really proud of his daughter. Trisha, according to her father, even declined to take alimony from Stephen. She had a career as a registered nurse. She didn't need anything from him. The divorce was finalized in February of 2016. Stephen was still an active duty airman stationed at Seymour Johnson, North Carolina. And now that the divorce was final, there was no need for Trisha and Faith to stay in that area. So 33-year-old Trisha packed up her belongings and went to Florida to be near family. She lived with her brother and his wife and their child for a bit while she got on her feet. But eventually she moved into her own place with two-year-old Faith and she began working as a hospice nurse. Life was good. Until April 27, 2016, when Trisha failed to pick up Faith from the babysitter and she failed to go to work at the hospice. And this was something Trisha would never do. While Trisha had a free spirit, the type of lady that would go for walks at 1 a.m. by herself, she would never intentionally fail to pick up her baby daughter. Trisha's brother went to her house and right away was thrown off guard when he saw Trisha's car parked outside the house but it wasn't in its normal parking spot. Additionally, a quick peek inside the car revealed Trisha's purse 
and her keys inside the car. Clearly, something was wrong, and Trisha's family immediately reported her missing. Trisha's brother, Jonathan Todd, said that at this point, it was like a twilight zone, like the earth had opened up and swallowed his sister. There was zero trace of Trisha. Initially, the detectives assigned to Trisha's case were concerned, but they weren't that concerned, right? She's a grown adult. But as the days went by, their suspicions that foul play was somehow involved, well, that was elevated, especially since Trisha's bank accounts hadn't been used, her cell phone hadn't been used, and no one had seen or heard from her. Investigators had to backtrack to figure out who was the last person to see Trisha, and that was pretty simple to discover. You see, the week before Trisha went missing, her ex-husband, Stephen Williams, he had made the 700-mile trek from North Carolina to Florida to visit with two-year-old Faith. He had rented out an Airbnb about three miles from Trisha's place. Since the divorce was so amicable, Trisha never really gave Stephen a hard time when he wanted to come see Faith. And on this occasion, on the night that Trisha went missing, Faith was staying with Stephen. Stephen, by this point, early on in the investigation, well, he was back at Seymour Johnson, where he was stationed. And then investigators from Florida called him up on the phone. They were like, hey, did you know that Trisha, your ex-wife, was missing? And they had questions like, do you know anything? Like, what can you give us? Stephen was shocked to hear that Trisha hadn't been heard from. And he disclosed that on the night that Trisha was last seen, Faith was staying with him, but she was really cranky and wouldn't fall asleep. So he text messaged Trisha to let her know. And immediately Trisha, being a good mom, she was like, listen, just hold on. I'll be right over. Trisha went to the Airbnb and when she was there, she was able to calm Faith down. And then Stephen claimed that when Trisha went to leave, crap, she was out of gas. This actually happened to be one of Stephen's biggest pet peeves. Trisha would always drive the car down to empty. So seeing as it was late, Stephen told Trisha, OK, fine, whatever. If you have some cash, just give me some cash. I'll go get you some gas. Trisha provided him with a $20 bill. He drove his car to the gas station up the block where he purchased an empty gas container, filled it up with two gallons, returned back to the house, put the gas in her car, and she was on her way. The next morning, he woke up with Faith and they went to Walmart for a few items. And then he called Trisha because he needed to get on the road. But her phone went straight to voicemail, which kind of annoyed him because, like I said, he needed to get back on the road. It was like a 10 hour trip, 700 plus miles. Well, he decided to call the babysitter and asked if he could drop Faith off and the babysitter agreed. So he dropped off the baby and he hit the road. Stephen was extremely calm over the phone. And when police checked out Stephen's story, it all checked out. There was video surveillance that showed him at the gas station buying gas when he said he was. There was video surveillance showing him and Faith at Walmart when he said he was. They checked his phone. It checked out. And the babysitter, she cooperated his story as well. So investigators kept on looking, even though, you know, hashtag the husband did it. They needed to keep looking for Trisha. She was nowhere to be found. Investigators then found the last known surveillance footage of Trisha from inside a grocery store on the last night she was seen. And she has this larger than life smile as she's checking out with her groceries. It doesn't seem like she has anything in particular on her mind. And strangely, when they check her house, the items she purchased that day at the grocery store were inside her place. And also the light was on almost as if she didn't expect to be gone long when she left. This case was getting stranger and stranger by the minute. Investigators start to look into her computer and her online dealings, and they quickly discover that Trisha has a love interest. Some musician slash ventriloquist guy. Trisha is obsessed with this guy. She sends him nonstop messages. She goes to his concert, but he has no interest in her. In fact, he hasn't responded to any of her messages. Well, investigators dig deeper and Trisha's friends confirm that Trisha is obsessed, capital O, to the point that she has plotted out a plan to go to his concert when he's back in town. She's going to wear this blue dress and she's going to confess her love to him. Now, the concert is a few days away. So investigators, they decide they're going to attend this concert. They're going to have a lookout inside the venue, outside the venue in hopes of seeing a glimpse of Trisha. Maybe she was running away from her with life as a single mom. But the concert comes and goes and Trisha was nowhere to be found. 
investigators are back to square one, but they make another discovery. Remember that Trisha was known to love late night walks to the beach? Well, in order to get to the beach from her house, she would have to walk through a part of town that wasn't known for being the safest. And while they're digging, they find that there is this older preacher gentleman that would oftentimes also go to the beach late at night. And they bring him in for questioning. And you can see his statement to police on the criminal confessions oxygen special that I talked about. And he agrees to take a polygraph. But before the polygraph, they're chatting with him and the man says that he was out the night Trisha disappeared, but he didn't see her that night. In fact, he was out that particular night to see the sea turtles lay their eggs. Now, the investigators are like squirming in their seats because what a bogus alibi, right? You're out looking at sea turtles in the middle of the night. But while it's a crazy story, the man is very cooperative. And when asked, he admits that Trisha was a very attractive lady. He says he spoke to her on various occasions about his faith in God and whatnot. But just as they're about to strap him to the polygraph machine, they inform him that they need him to tell them a lie so that they can better understand his internal system. And right away, the man's like, wait, what? I'm a man of God and I'm not going to lie about anything. And he goes on and on and on. And eventually he says, you know what? I'm not taking this polygraph. (laughs) Now, the investigators are rightfully upset. But turns out that every single suspect in this particular case has refused to take a polygraph. And while declining a polygraph makes the investigators believe these people are suspicious, it's not even remotely possible that they're all somehow involved in Trisha's disappearance. So clearly, they're not all guilty just because they're declining this polygraph. When it comes to vitamins, we all deserve to be a little bit of a skeptic. And if you are, that's a good thing, especially when it comes to vitamins, which is why I choose to take the Ritual Essential for Women 18 Plus multivitamin. Ritual created a clinically backed multivitamin for women who are 18 and over. Ritual's multivitamin supports brain health, bone health, blood health, and provides antioxidant support. And above all else, Ritual has traceable key ingredients in clean bioavailable forms. I've always, or almost always, been a vitamin consumer, but I never liked the taste, chalky and honestly just nasty. I often wondered what all those ingredients even meant on the label, but I figured, hey, I needed the vitamins, so I just put up with the horrid taste and the ingredients I couldn't even pronounce. But that is now an issue of the past, ever since I found Ritual, because Ritual comes packed with nine key nutrients in two capsules per day. So you can take your vitamins and relax knowing that you are in good hands. Another thing is that Ritual is packaged in a minty capsule that will leave you feeling refreshed. I've been using Ritual Essential for Women for two months now and I couldn't be happier. So listen up, no more shady business. Ritual's Essential for Women 18 Plus is a multivitamin you can actually trust. And right now, Ritual is offering my listeners 10% off during your first three months. Visit ritual.com slash military10 to start Ritual or to add Essential for Women 18 Plus to your subscription today. Florida detectives asked their North Carolina counterparts to call Stephen in for questioning. There's nothing like a good face-to-face conversation. And they call him in and Stephen goes down to chat with the North Carolina detectives completely voluntarily. He's there, he's happy-go-lucky and he's cooperative, but there's something about him that seems off as he's talking. He tells them that he knows he's the main suspect since he's a husband or the ex-husband or whatever, and he's eager to basically clear his name. So he talks. He gives the same story as he did on the phone with the Florida detectives. He even agrees to take a polygraph test. And shockingly, the results are inconclusive. So it's neither good nor bad for the investigation. It's just a giant dud. But this time, the detectives feel something is off. It's just that little tiny inkling. So the Florida detectives start to look a little deeper into Stephen's story. And as they're canvassing the area where Trisha lives, boom, they hit the jackpot. Trisha's neighbor recalls seeing a man similar in stature and appearance to Stephen driving Trisha's car on the night she disappeared. Wait, what? This is odd because Stephen never indicated he drove Trisha's car for any reason. Detectives then find some of Trisha's online journals that reveal that her picture-perfect marriage to Stephen 
was anything but. Turns out that during their 11-year marriage, Stephen killed at least two of Trisha's beloved pets. And to top it off, there is one police report of domestic violence. But that case never made it inside a courtroom. I'm assuming that's because Trisha did not want to pursue the charge. And there is one incident where Stephen kicked Trisha in the stomach while she was pregnant with baby Faith. Detectives dig deeper, and when they request all of the footage from Trisha's apartment heading towards Stephen's Airbnb, they spot something. At about 4 a.m. on the morning that Trisha went missing, they spot a man wearing dark clothing, wearing a hoodie, carrying a large military-style bag on his back. The footage is grainy, but it's interesting because it comes from where the person is coming from Trisha Todd's apartment towards the Airbnb, but the Airbnb is like three miles away. But who the hell walks around that late at night with such a large bag? Detectives get a hold of Stephen's mother, and really, that was the most shocking of all of the interviews they conducted in the case. Because Stephen's own mother tells detectives that Stephen, in fact, despised his ex-wife, Trisha. In fact, he would often comment on how good it would be if she just disappeared. And when asked, Stephen's own mother admitted she thought that her son had something to do with Trisha's disappearance. Now, listen, if your own mama thinks you're guilty, you're probably guilty. Armed with Stephen's mom's statement, the damning video surveillance, and let's not forget the neighbor's eyewitness testimony, Florida detectives jumped on an airplane and they knocked on Stephen's door. Turns out that surprise, surprise, Stephen had a live-in girlfriend. And while Stephen and Trisha's divorce had been finalized back in February of 2016, well, he and this new woman began dating long before his divorce was final. This piqued the investigator's interest, right? Was the new live-in girlfriend in on Trisha's disappearance? Portions of the interview with the girlfriend can be seen on the Oxygen Network special Criminal Confessions, and she looks really uncomfortable. She stands by her man 100% and she provides a solid alibi for herself. She had been working when Trisha went missing and she didn't travel with Stephen when he visited Faith. In fact, the girlfriend reassures the investigators that Stephen likes being a part-time dad and he would not jeopardize that. He would never want to be a full-time dad. Of this, she is sure. Meanwhile, in the next room, Stephen is giving his same old story that he's given a few times already. He had nothing to do with Trisha's disappearance. But then investigators get him with the sneak attack. They mention they have video footage of him driving Trisha's car. They have video footage of him walking near her neighborhood. And the investigators drop a bombshell. The surveillance video in front of one of the facilities he was caught on. Well, that was an HD camera. Stephen begins to hyperventilate. He's busted. And then Stephen begins to tell a different story. This time, when he returns to the house with the gas, Trisha is somehow laying on the floor injured from Lord knows what. He begins to panic as he sees her, believing that this looks really bad. And that's when he comes up with a plan to dispose of her body. He puts her in the car and drops her in a wooded area. And the investigators are like, boom, we got our guy. But they know time is of the essence. They need the body. As Taylor Swift sings in her most recent hit, No Body, No Crime. So detectives ask him to take them to her. And he says he can't because he can't remember where he put her. And well, with at least his somewhat of a confession, they have him and they bring him back to Florida. But he's still a free man. Detectives don't want to freak him out, right? They want him to keep talking. And their number one fear is that he will lawyer up. They arrive in Florida and they get in the car and Stephen is taking them in circles, in circles, in circles, in circles, saying he doesn't remember where he put Trisha's body. Everyone is getting pissed. Eventually, they bring him back to the station and everyone is just straight up exhausted. He is questioned again. And this time he confesses to a little more. This time, when Trisha was about to leave, she got up all in his face about all the back child support he owed her. And when she stepped up to him, he pushed her and she fell and hit her head. And that's when he panicked. But he refuses to give up her location, saying he didn't remember. 
And with that, the prosecutor charged Stephen Williams in the state of Florida with second degree murder. Of course, there was also the child endangerment because according to his own confession, as he went to dispose of Trisha's body, he left two-year-old Faith alone in his Airbnb. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to have a therapist, someone that you could talk to in a judgment-free zone? Maybe you have thought about it, but you were scared away by the thought of taking the first step, or maybe you thought therapy wasn't affordable. Try Talkspace. By doing virtual therapy, Talkspace has made getting people help easy, accessible, and affordable. Y'all don't know this, but some things in my life recently have really gotten me down. I wasn't quite sure how to get out of the funk. I wasn't sure how to get back up. So I figured I would try therapy because I was sure that it would definitely not make things any worse. And I'm so glad that I tried it. I have found new coping mechanisms to deal with stress and I'm now looking forward to my future. Talkspace makes it easy to find a therapist that you like and it's so convenient to do everything from the comfort of wherever you are because life sometimes gets hectic. Sometimes I take my calls in my office, sometimes I take my calls in the car. Life is mobile and therapy should be too. At Talkspace.com, you can sign up online and get a personalized match with a provider that's right for you. And it's typically done within 48 hours. Talkspace is the number one online therapy platform with licensed therapists in over 40 specialties, including anxiety, depression, relationship issues, and much more. And right now, as a listener of this show, you'll get $100 off your first month with Talkspace when you go to Talkspace.com slash military murder. To match with a licensed therapist today, visit Talkspace.com slash military murder to get $100 off your first month and to show your support for the show. That's Talkspace.com slash military murder. Everyone was beyond themselves. The Todd family never in a million years would have suspected Stephen of killing their daughter. And at this point, they just wanted to know where Trisha's body was located. They wanted a proper burial for their only daughter. Prosecutors considered a plea deal, but just as they were considering it, the defense counsel proposed a deal. Stephen Williams would plead guilty to second degree murder in exchange for no longer than a 35 year sentence. And with that, he would bring them to Trisha's body. Detectives and prosecutors, not believing this to be a premeditated murder, felt that this was their only way to return Trisha back to her family. And the Todd family, they also agreed. They felt this was the best thing they could do. They had already searched for Trisha near her apartment for over five weeks. They searched on foot. They searched with dogs. They searched by airplane. There was no sign of Trisha anywhere. The only way they could ever get closure is if they made this agreement. On September 30th, 2016, Stephen Williams appeared in court and he pled no contest to second degree murder and child neglect, and he was sentenced to 35 years in prison. Immediately after his trial concluded, he was shackled and detectives walked him down to a car where Stephen would lead them to Trisha's body, but they were not expecting to find what they found. When the detectives asked Stephen's attorney where Trisha was, he told them, Stephen's going to take you to her body. She would be located in a three by two plastic tote filled with muriatic acid. Detectives' eyes bulged out of their head as they asked out loud how he got a grown adult female to fit into such a small plastic tote. And the attorney responded, he chopped her up so she could fit. (gasps) Their faces turned white as Casper the ghost. The prosecutor, Thomas Bachdahl, who made the deal, realized. Holy crap, he made a deal with the devil, but he'd be in for a rude awakening when he realized the extent of Stephen Williams' evilness. Detectives arrive at the Hungryland Wildlife Reserve. They park the car and Stephen Williams exits the car with a small flagpole. He beelines directly to a spot and he puts the flag down. There was no mistaking that Stephen knew exactly where he had buried Trisha. He had been playing detectives all along. They ask him how far they have to dig and he says not too far. 
So they begin their task of digging and it doesn't take them much digging when they hit upon a plastic tote. And when they pull it out, sure enough, it's filled with acid. And as they're pulling it up, the lid slides off and they see it. It's Trisha's torso. I am sure that a few people lost their lunch during this recovery. Everyone is now well aware that this was more than just an accident. This was premeditated murder. Where the hell did Stephen Williams get this toe and this acid at midnight after an alleged accident? And better yet, where did he get such professional tools? Investigators searched the nearby canal, which, by the way, was infested with alligators. And that's where they found the tools that he used. A chainsaw, some pliers, and a reciprocating saw. And detectives described that Trisha's hair and some portions of her body were still on parts of those tools. Shockingly, among the pebbles and rocks located not too far from the plastic tote, they discovered nine of Trisha's teeth and her fingertips. Stephen had removed these to make it harder for Trisha to be identified had she been discovered. What a freaking psychopath. With that, Stephen Williams is taken to prison in Florida to serve out his 35-year sentence. The entire investigation was led by the Martin County Sheriff's Office, specifically Detective Yesenia Cardi and Michael Oliver, along with various other detectives. The North Carolina detectives helped with the initial interview, and the Air Force Office of Special Investigations was, of course, kept in the loop about everything along the way. Ultimately, everyone wanted to talk to Stephen to find out the truth. The reports in the documentaries are confusing on who ultimately got a full post-sentencing confession from Stephen. Some say it was OSI, while reports predominantly say it was a detective from the Martin County Sheriff's Office. Regardless of who got the confession, Stephen tells a gruesome tale. Stephen admits that he planned to kill Trisha long before he left North Carolina. In fact, he planned it so far in advance that he was able to order the chainsaw from Amazon and he got the acid from North Carolina about a month or two before the murder. Also, before he even got into town, he drove on over to the Hungryland Wildlife Reserve, dug a hole large enough to fit the plastic tote. He then placed the tote in the hole poured the acid inside, and then he just left, driving to his Airbnb. By the way, apparently he used his government computer to look up different types of acid, which is nuts. When he was at the Airbnb, eventually he got the baby, he called Trisha over. He didn't call Trisha over though that night to calm Faith. He called her over to kill her. In fact, reports indicate that they had spent all day together. But during the day when he had intended to do this, he got cold feet, so he didn't do anything. Then at night, he got up the courage. He texted her to come over. Then when he answered the door, he sneak attacked her, grabbed her by the throat until she passed out. He then zip tied her hands and her feet because he didn't intend to kill her right then and there. In fact, he wanted her to come too because he was going to ask her for all of her email passwords her bank account passwords. He wanted everything. His intent was to make it look like she had last minute decided to go on a missionary trip. But his plan failed. When Trisha regained consciousness and all she did was just scream bloody murder. So Stephen hit her over the head with a club until according to his own words, quote, her heart stopped beating, end quote. He then placed her body in a trash bag. His intent all along was to drive Trisha to the reserve in her own car. But when he got in the car and started driving, the car was out of gas, which really put a hitch in his plan. The wildlife reserve was only a 20 minute drive from Hope Springs, but round trip, it was 40 miles and he didn't think the car would make it. And really, the fact that he had to go get gas in his own car, return to her car. Well, that part of the story really helped him evade capture for much longer than detectives would have liked. Once Stephen gassed up Trisha's car, he left with Trisha in a trash bag and drove to the Hungryland Reserve, 
Reminder, he left little two-year-old Faith alone while he was at the Hungry Land late that night. When he got there, he put on a plastic suit and goggles and he proceeded to dismember his ex-wife. He extracted her teeth and cut off her fingertips. He then opened the tote that was already buried and threw in Trisha's body parts into the acid. Then he covered the hole. He then walked over to the canal that was infested with alligators. He grabbed the bag of teeth from his pocket, but the teeth fell out of the bag, which is why it was mixed in with the pebbles. He then disposed of all of his tools in the canal, which he thought, due to the fact that it was inhabited by alligators, he thought detectives would never find because they would never search it. But most, if not all, of the tools he used were recovered by a dive team. Stephen then drove Trisha's car back to her house and he walked back to his Airbnb all three miles, which is how he was caught on those surveillance videos. I want to play a part of one of the investigating agent's statements. This statement was made before Stephen was charged with anything, while they were still trying to get the truth out of Stephen Williams. So what I want to do is try to try to set the set the stage so that you can actually tell the narrative about what actually happened, which is not that you planned all this, okay? Not that you planned down here to come down here and kill her and send her out into the woods like some sort of mass murderer. I mean, really? I mean, like, like you're going to go chop her up into little bits or something like that? I mean, that, that seems kind of ridiculous, okay? It seems far-fetched, like you said, okay? And I don't think you planned all this. I don't think you're capable of that. Isn't that statement crazy? Everything that agent says, everything that detective says, that maybe he didn't really believe were true, well, turns out he was dead on. Stephen Williams must have been pooping his pants thinking, oh crap, they know more than they are letting on. Turns out they didn't know more. They didn't realize this military man could be capable of one of the most heinous crimes they had ever investigated. A military man, nonetheless, a family man. But, you know, they say people who kill animals are some of the most psychotic out there. And many people knew that Stephen was capable of doing this. When they asked Stephen for his motive, Stephen said he was sick and tired of Trisha disrespecting him. And he was tired of having to split custody with Trisha. And while their divorce seemed amicable, Deep down inside, Stephen Williams felt he was paying way too much in child custody and he really wanted to have full custody of Faith. Trisha's family, if they are not sent from heaven above, man, I don't know who is. During the Crime Watch Daily episode that I watched, both Trisha's father, Dave, and her brother, Jonathan, who has adopted Faith and is raising her together with his wife and their own biological daughter, well, they say that they forgive Stephen Williams. In fact, David Todd, Trisha's dad, says that since Trisha is already up in heaven, instead of praying for her at night, he prays for Stephen Williams. Ultimately, the prosecuting attorney still has hope. According to the prosecutor's statement on criminal confessions, Thomas Bachdahl indicates that the Air Force still has jurisdiction over the crime that Stephen committed while he served in the Air Force. And while the state can no longer go after him, even though they made a deal with the devil, the Air Force, the federal government, still can. However, as of the recording of that episode, the Air Force has not taken any steps to take criminal actions against Stephen Williams, although it does not mean they will not. But if I were a betting woman, I would bet everything that they would take no action on this case. Although I do pray that I'm wrong because seriously, this is one of the most heinous crimes of premeditated murder I have seen. And really, he deserves to never walk a free man. And as of right now, he only has 30 years left of his time in prison. If you or anyone you know is suffering from domestic violence, there are various agencies that can help. You can contact the Domestic Violence Hotline, also known just as the Hotline. They can be reached at 1-800-799-7233. The call is free, confidential, and available 24-7. 
Thanks for tuning in for another episode of Military Murder. If you are a fan of this podcast, consider leaving a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts to help me grow the show and to allow others to more easily find their new weekly true crime binge. For more Military Murder during the week, follow me on social on Instagram at Military Murder Podcast. And don't forget to join the Facebook community at facebook.com slash groups slash military true crime. Military Murder was created by Mama Margot Productions and is produced in collaboration with my boot camp and higher fan club members. This month's executive producers are Falcon 13 and Nicole. This week's newest associate producer is Heather B. And our newest assistant producers are Samantha M., Sean S., Melanie, and special shout out to Andrew R. for increasing his monthly donation. The music was created by TyOps. Until next time, remember, you never really know what someone is capable of. So remain vigilant always. You have a fabulous week and I'll keep digging to bring you another military murder story next week. Shh, let's work another podcast.